Hey guys, how's it going? It's me, Josh Halter, owner and founder of The Bio Dude. Around me is my showroom here at The Bio Dude Houston, open Monday through Friday, 8 to 4. Come visit my Facebook, the Instagram, biodude.com. Next to me, I got an 18 by 18 by 48 chameleon cage. And today, I am gonna show you guys how to build a fully self-cleaning, self-maintaining, bioactive vivarium utilizing that chameleon pouch for panther chameleons. And I'm really excited to do this video because I know you guys have been asking. And I know a good amount about panther chameleons, but a close friend of mine named Tommy knows a lot more. He is the business owner of tcinsects.com. I get all my feeder bugs for my entire facility from him. And I'm so happy to bring him here onto the BioDudes YouTube channel. Tommy, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hey, I'm Tommy with TC Insects. We're a local Houston-based feeder company. We focus on high quality insects. Um, we supply a lot of breeders, businesses. Um, recently, we even went solar powered. So um, I also breed panther chameleons. That's what got me into breeding bugs in the first place because I was paying quite a bit for my bugs. So um, I started doing research and about a year and a half ago, we started up. So we're a fairly new company and uh, we're here today to show y'all how to set up a panther chameleon vivarium. I'm really, really excited. So this is the Zoomed brand of the, of, this is the largest one that they make. Next week, I'm getting all the Exoterra screen cages into, and I'll have all the chameleon pouches for those size cages and chameleon kits for those size cages as well. And I'm really, really excited to do an overview video comparison, the Exoterras and the Zoomed. So that's coming. So I guess the, let's get started with what I got here. Above me, you can see my Grow and Glow LED uh, with my LED props. I have this LED on here solely for the live plants that are gonna be in this enclosure. And the live plants that I'm gonna be utilizing is a large ficus tree, as well as a couple other larger plants uh, to make our panther chameleon feel a little bit more home, uh, more at home while allowing them to actually grow and flourish in the terrarium with the amount of substrate that we're using. A very big benefit to using substrate with old world chameleons is when you're keeping females, veiled chameleons especially, they can develop their own eggs because that's what they're physiologically designed to do. And if you let that go, they can become egg bound. And what can happen is if you don't give them a viable option or place to lay their eggs, you know, that could be an expensive vet visit with some oxytocin or it could result in, you know, losing your, losing your girl a lot sooner than you should. So it's just giving us a little bit more of an opportunity and a more efficient way of keeping these remarkable animals. So, Tommy, I'm really excited. You guys know the pouch. So, it's definitely so you know, what we're gonna do, and Tommy, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ha ha have you put it in here. If you wanna go and put the pouch around the whole perimeter of the enclosure. Definitely. Definitely. All right, so I'm gonna put the pouch right in the middle before we fill it up. We'll be adding the ficus tree first, right? Uh, yep. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I like to show all of my viewers just for the effort of, of full disclosure is you guys can see that the pouch is slightly larger and in, in height than the actual terrarium itself. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to fold it down so that way it's a little bit lower. So that way it ma so that way it matches a little bit and it look it doesn't look like it's taken up a lot of space like there's a lot of open edges but once the substrate gets in here this is going to expand and while there are going to be open edges which is one of the cons here around the perimeter of using the chameleon pouches we ha here at the BioDude found a really easy method to ensuring that a crickets don't get stuck down there b your chameleons don't get stuck down there and c that it still looks nice so Tommy, what we're gonna do, let's go ahead and get, uh, let's get the uh, ficus tree in here first, and then we're gonna put the, uh, put, put, put the substrate in. So what's really nice about going with this method is we're able to completely remove the tree from the pot. And the reason that we're able to do that and wanna do that is because trees aren't meant to grow in pots. They have extensive root system and they need a lot of space. So, and able to do that, you know, we need to give that, give that tree a lot of substrate and that's exactly what the chameleon pouches allow us to do. Excellent. Perfect. Job, dude. So, you can see how, you can see how the ficus, you know, uh, how much space it takes up. I wanted to go with a slightly smaller to start mainly just because this tree is going to grow and it's going to grow very quickly, especially with a Miss King 
two mist kings being out there at the very top as you can see the holes at the top ready for the bulkheads so you know uh, we lost a little bit of leaves here from the Texas heat because it's been hot lately but it's okay you know I think it's pretty good as far as the other plants here Tommy let, let, let let's show the viewers what we got awesome um, I got some really nice Brahms in here which I yeah, dig these are awesome yeah so I really like to like to use the bromeliads just because to to give them options. So you know, since the axles hold water, mm -hmm. it's really nice that you know if they actually end up get closer to not on the ground but slightly above that they can use these axles to find access to get access to water. Um, again, more opportunities for hydration is really important when keeping chameleons. Definitely, and moving water is what they're attracted to. Uh, they'll. When you mist, and you should be misting at least four times a day, they'll take it directly off the leaves. And if water tends to pool anywhere and they see it moving from Interesting. water sources. Let me ask you, Tommy, how do you feel about using commercial waterfalls for pet chameleons? I feel that com commercial waterfalls, if they're not upkept, that they can have a buildup of bacteria that could harm the chameleons. Makes sense. But if it was a sterile source and it was moving, it would definitely be good for the chameleon and could be used, but that could, that's a, it's never often the case. I understand that, I understand that. So if we do have, you know, some of our, some of my viewers that want to use, you know, like the Exoterra waterfall or anything like that, what sterilizing techniques w would you recommend to make sure that, you know, besides checking the back reservoir every day to make sure we don't have any drowned insects, you know, besides routine the water, what disinfectant do you Definitely would you apple cider vinegar. Okay. Um, you can nice. clean that out weekly as part of your routine. And I believe it even has a small filter in there as well. Mm -hmm. That will need to be cleaned out and maybe even soaked in apple cider vinegar and a solution, of course. And then afterwards, completely rinse it, put it back together. Okay. And yes, it, it can definitely be used. Nice, good. That, 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 that's good to know. So the substrate that I'm gonna be using is my terra firma. A lot, I'll, I'll, all you viewers know how, uh, about my firma, how it stays dry at the top and moist in the middle and bottom layers, but the most important thing is that it, that it retains all tunnels and burrows. When I got back to earlier about the old world chameleons having, having the need to be able to, to burrow to lay their eggs, this provides you the means for your girls to do that. And yeah, that's very important. Um, I breed chameleons and often if I don't have them in the right substrate, while they're digging their egg laying tunnel, it can collapse on them. And in the beginning, mm -hmm. when I was a novice, I would have to dig out, twice it happened, I would have to dig out my female chameleon because the hole that she was digging had collapsed on her. Yep. So that's extremely important yes. if you're keeping a female chameleon. Especially if you're using substrate as well. So I think, I think let's get some of the substrate added. What do you think? Cool, that's so like let's grab the bins. So this is one of my this is my straight firma mix. Uh, look, a hornworm. Oh, nice. That's awesome. Nice. So I have bins of firma that has been jump started already, uh, like in bins around my warehouse. There's earwigs in here. There's dubias in here. There's isos. There's springtails, oh, wow. and it's fortified with the with my bio shot. And all we're gonna do is we're gonna scoop, and we're gonna slowly get the get this filled up here. Now that, now that hornworm pupae, do you know anything about that? How long would that take to? That in the right conditions and with the right humidity, it'll pupate in about 14 days. And okay. It'll become the tobacco hawk moth, also known as the hummingbird moth. Oh. Um, they're, they're so awesome because they can hover mid air, just like a hummingbird. And if you have hummingbird feeders and you're in the south, you can often see them feeding at your hummingbird feeders directly with their uh, proboscis their tongue so um, they're really cool um, we just started breeding them we're not offering them right now we'll have them in about two weeks but, I'm excited um, for that because I go through beautiful. three cultures a week oh wow yeah I mean the Chinese the Chinese gliding frogs love them um, awesome. yeah the so as you guys can see you know we're doing a really generous layer here and after everything's said and done uh, I'm going to have, I'd say, about a solid 12 inches of substrate here, including the moss that's going to be surrounding, to give, A, um, the tree enough soil to continually grow and stay healthy, and, of course, have enough soil for the actual 
uh, tunneling abilities of the firma. Oh, look, found a roach. Oh, wow. I'm just going to put him in there. Mel. There you go. So the question I'm going to get, are the roaches going to breed in here? They might. Are crickets going to breed in here? They might. They can, yeah. Are superworms going to breed in here? They might. It's all about, you know, making sure that, sorry about that, all right. that we provide enough nutrition for your soil, as well as making sure that we provide enough surface area for the roots, which is what we're doing. Found a super worm. Oh, cool. Oh, he's dark too. Yeah. He's about a molt. They get dark like that when they're going to molt. Interesting. So. Oh man, another one. Yep. Look at this one. Oh, this nice. Might be a big male. That's crazy. Yeah. So, like I said, for for a lot, I just I like to jump start on with soils that just kind of function for a while. So, as you guys know about my BioShot, essentially what the BioShot does is, in a lot of cases, it will and can replace the springtails and isopods. What this is is cultured. <clears throat> what this is is cultured uh, mycorrhizal fungi and bacteria that essentially jumpstart those organic processes that is a byproduct of what the isopods and springtails do to break down organic matter such as shed, feces, biodegradables and turns them into a viable organic nutrient that can not only be utilized by your soil but by plant roots as well helping to form a symbiotic, uh, excuse me, a symbiotic relationship as well as giving you the full aspect of the self-cleaning, self-maintaining environment. With a cage like this, uh, your initial ma maintenance on your tree, you're gonna have to water your tree every so often until you notice it gets established. Regardless if the Miss King is going off every single day, the first week after planting your tree is when it's most What's the word I'm looking for? Transplant uh, shock. Yes, transplant shock. Mm -hmm. Now the bio shock really, really helps with that. It plays a huge role in preventing that shock, but it's a tree. You know, trees are, you know, a little bit more sensitive than some of your tropical plants. So that's always something to keep in mind. So as you can see, I've got an earwig in here too. Let's, oh, cool. Let me pull it out. Oh, he's a big one too. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> it's amazing. They're all so dark coming out yep. of the soil. There's a darkling beetle. Oh, cool. I'm going to put him in there. So uh, I'm surprised we haven't seen any isos yet. They're usually all over, the, all over the place. So the next thing that I'm going to want to do is you see we have these open spaces here. Now, some keepers are going to want to leave them open. Some keepers are going to want to stuff them with my sphagnum moss. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm just going to take this moss and I'm just going to put it right on the side. And this is in its 100% dry form. So this isn't wet or anything like that. So the, bio, the biodegradable bag that is included with your Panther Chameleon Bioactive Kit, you can literally take it right out of the bag and use it to stuff the sides because there is extra included in the kit to compensate, you know, that. Will crickets and other roaches potentially get down there? Sometimes. If you feed from a cup, you're not really gonna have that issue. If you like to dump the crickets in there and dump the roaches in there, Obviously, your chameleon is going to get to eat. Will some of them most likely make their way down here or make their way into the soil? Absolutely possible, but it's not something that I would be too entirely concerned about. With springtails and isopods and, of course, other bugs, it's a screen cage, so you always have that little minute chance of them maybe getting out. However, with springtails and isopods, I wouldn't be the least bit concerned if they got out of your cage because there's nothing for them to eat. They wouldn't survive you're going to find them on your floor you either pick them up and put them back in the cage or like if you're like my wife you put them in the toilet so you know it really just depends on 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 what you want yeah a lot, but, a lot of the commercial feeders of, of roaches especially dubia roaches if they do get out a lot of keepers are concerned that they're going to infest your house or something like that yep as long as you have a clean kept house and at room conditions at, at room temperature conditions you don't have to worry about that it's not something that's going to be an issue. So if they do get out, you can either dispose of them mm -hmm. or feed them to your reptile if yep. they haven't been out for too long, maybe yep. getting into something. Yes, exactly. So I'm putting a little bit of spag moss here at the top. Cool. Uh, and the next thing that I'm going to add is, is some leaf litter. Now, I want you guys to think of the leaf litter as the fuel, just like the spag moss. So what's going to happen is the, the leaf litter and the spag moss is going to be slowly broken down by your detrivores as well as your 
<clears throat> as well as your natural organic processes input in via the BioShot. I'm gonna put these in here slightly. And, uh, and the, essentially that'll turn into essential organic nutrients for your soil and your plants. So now we have our entire base layer system done here. We have our chameleon pouch that's filled with my terra firma. We have about a, 12, a 10 and a half to 12 inch layer, depending on what if we're in the front or the back, with, the, with my AAA spag moss around the sides. A new product that I have is my paperback bark. That is an extremely lightweight isopod bark that's harvested from California. Um, and what's great about it, it's very porous, like the southern palm bark, as, but it's very, very, very light. This whole bundle here in my hand maybe weighs an ounce, if, if that. And I'm just gonna put a little bit of the paperback bark by breaking it in chunks. Here you go, dude. Awesome, thank you. Throughout. And it almost feels rubbery in its texture. Yeah, it like is. I don't like sponge, I don't like touching this stuff, but it works. It works great. Oh, it feels like a mushroom. Yes, it yes, does exactly feel like, like a, a mushroom. Portobello mushroom. Yes, that's a really good way to put it. Okay, yeah. excellent. Cool. So, and the next thing that I want to put in here, I'm thinking the bromeliads. Yes, um, definitely. Maybe back here in the back or in the foreground. What do you think? Those are a bit taller. So. These are, so I think because uh, I'm going to hope that these are going to grow upwards. Definitely. So, so maybe about like right here? Yes, perfect. Okay, yeah, perfect. you happy yeah, with I'll that? Go ahead and go take ahead, yeah, out. yeah, if you want to plant them in there. Yep, and, what, and now these are the mother plant bromeliads that I sell with two, with one, one mother, two pups. Uh, these you can grow in the ground, but if you really wanted to, you can mount them epiphytically, which you can see behind me in the red eye enclosure. They're all mounted epiphytically with some live moss, so you can grow bromeliads either way. But as, if you plant them in the ground, it's very important to know that they require extremely well-drained soil. Uh, and since the firma aerates top to bottom with all the necessary organic drivers in there, we have nothing to worry about as far as ensuring that they're going to rot or not get enough water. I like that because if we decide to come down here, you know, it gives us the option to, uh, to, to get some water. Okay. I got, uh, I got some Bella Palms here, and I got a, a, a three-pack of the Dracanias. Okay, so, and which one of these gets the tallest? Honestly, they, they get about the same. I've, okay. seen these, I've seen these trees taller than, this build, than, taller than my building before. Oh, wow. Um, but they get, like, really, it takes them a long, long, long time. Okay. Cool. Um, so, so probably think. in the back corner. Sometimes. Okay. Okay. I'll let you do awesome. your thing. Awesome. Awesome. Okay, I'm going to put him in the back right corner. I'm going to keep him in the bio bag. So that the roots can grow. I like that up. name, the bio bag. <laughs> hey, that, it sounds yeah. quite catchy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I like that a lot. Okay. Cool. So then we'll put these. Um, yes. Maybe we'll <laughs> mix them out a bit. And sometimes if I'm not 100% sure, you don't have to commit with a, digging a hole. You can just place them to see how they would look. So I'm going to put, you tend to want to have smaller plants that don't get as high in the foreground so that when somebody's approaching your display, whatever mm. you have, it has a slope where it gets taller in the back and shorter in the front. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. So. So, so with, uh, with, with these guys being, you know, from, from Madagascar and everything, is there a very particular type of tree or plant that, you know, that is commercially available that either I could carry besides, you know, your typical Chefalera, Ficuses? I've been trying to find hibiscus. Clean hibiscus That's is the hardest thing to find. Mm -hmm. You can get you can get a ten gallon pot of hibiscus down here for ten dollars, but it's dirty. For for beginner keepers, this ficus is a great start. Okay. They don't require very intense light. They can tolerate um, if you go on vacation and you're not able to water it every day. They can tolerate that. They can grow quickly under the right conditions. So you'll probably have to be trimming them back. Also, also, the variegated pothos ivy is great for beginners as well. Think it's about very that. low light. Yep. You often see them inside uh, Mexican restaurants. They'll have them all around. Yep. They, they can grow in almost no light. It's true. And the, the big waxy leaves puddle the water so greatly, and the chameleons can drink right off the leaves. And that makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. All about creating hydration opportunities for these guys, because chameleons are not physiologically designed to get dehydrated w would you agree uh, that's the with neonates or young chameleons that's 
the number one cause to make them go down yep. is dehydration. Cool. Well, since we're on the topic of hydration, before we get any further with building, let's talk about our options for maintaining that hydration. So over here, I have a few. I'm not trying to push you out oh, here. Good, um, so I've so honestly, if you keep chameleons, you should have a Miss King. You should, if you have chameleons, this should just be part of your husbandry expense. If not, you're going to have to be misting that cage a couple times a day for them to get the amount of beneficial water that they need. Your other options are you have your hand misters. You know, you can, I sell these on my website as well. And some people like to supplement the misting with the foggers. The foggers will not replace the misting, but it will help give you some of the humidity spikes throughout the day, um, which is really going to help because the key with chameleons is good airflow. And that's something that Tommy and I will definitely touch base on, you know, as we further progress, you know, into the video, uh, you know, and it's always important that you to give them, you know, clean water. So one of the options that you can use is Zumed's Reptisafe, and that's just to take the chloramines, chlor you know, irons and metals and the chlorines out of the water. So that way, A, it doesn't leave the residuals on the glass. B, it doesn't ruin your nozzles over time with all the junk in the water. And C, it just makes it slightly more suitable for your reptiles to drink. You know, the best care rather than, rather than basic care. You guys know, know how and, it and goes. And the fogger, you can run that at night. It's best run at night. Ah. It's uh, often recommended for about an hour for panther chameleons. Uh, usually in the middle of the night when it's cool, um, they can actually hydrate um, directly from the air. So this is a, a really big care requirement if you want to take your husbandry up a level. That, I did not know that. That's good to know. So we run foggers at night. So would, would you recommend I do that for my carpets? For your carpets? Yeah, they're, they're definitely, they're a cooler species. They like humidity. Yeah. Yes, run at nighttime. Uh, you want to okay. not have too long of a duration, just a little bit, and it depends on your humidity. In drier areas, you can run it longer. Down here in Houston, Texas, not as much because okay. we're already at 63%. I know, it's yeah. awful. All right, uh, so let's, I, I vote we get some branches in here. So I grabbed a few. Oh, wow. I grabbed the Manzanita branch. So this is a newer wood that I like sell. So whenever I ship this out to you guys, I ship it in its own box. It's net nothing it will ever be in the box with these, and that is to that is to protect their integrity. And I also have a couple pieces of ghost wood here. Now this cage I'm I'm designing just to be a little bit more open, uh, and the only reason I'm doing that is just because these plants are going to grow really quickly and essentially take over the cage. And panther, uh, this is for would be considered a smaller cage, I guess, a good cage for an adult panther. Definitely, this is exactly what's recommended. It's two foot by two foot by four foot. <laughs> this is what you need for an adult male. Yep, and you know, with how they, how big they are, just their sheer size, we want to give them space to move so they don't feel that cluttered. Because honestly, in Madagascar, you know, from my understanding, you, people drive down the road and see them right out in the open on trees. Oh yeah, and they also they think just it's don't bad care. luck to be bitten by one. Yep, uh, really, really cool. <laughs> interesting, yeah. Yeah, interesting. So yeah, I dig it. I dig it. All right, all right. <laughs> I will, if you want to throw in the, that uh, manzanita and I will play off the manzanita you know, with... I just love how this looks first. Yeah. So I'm probably going to put this off over in the back and give him some more walking room to walk up this back nice. side. Nice. And then I think what I'm going to do... Yeah, if you want many horizontal layers, especially you're going to have to have a basket spot that stays between 85 and 90. If you want to have multiple layers of horizontal branches for your pavilion to perch on so it can thermoregulate during the day. Okay, that's good to know. Cool. Oh man, that looks so cool. Yeah, so what I'm gonna have to do is I'm gonna put um, pieces here and here and here that are gonna be held in with nuts and bolts. I should have had that for you guys, I'm so sorry, to prevent this from falling down. And then after this is attached in, I'm gonna most likely add a thin piece of ghost wood about this size going across like this so that way we have a total of two options for basking um, and then have the ability to you know to go from there but this is a pretty sparser open cage but again i wanted you guys to really be able to see more along the lines of just um, a this bottom system because to me to me the bottom system will take care of the rest would you agree with that yes definitely um if the bottom of the cage isn't taken care of and fecal matter builds up that for chameleons are known for being delicate and you definitely yes. don't want to mix in bacteria or protozoa into that mix yes 
So especially yeah, the yeah, the the bad bacteria will not be no, will not be that ba- great. Good bacteria like mysochloride that will make plants explode. It'll um, the microfauna and everything will just go crazy. It's uh, okay. extremely important. Okay. As far as uh, now, as far as, as the heating is concerned, I like to use the thermo- my thermo- thermometer hygrometer. Uh, we also uh, I have this set aside, so I, I like the glow lights, and I just put a, a hundred watt here, and so you, your temperatures are going to be dependent on where you live. What size bulb that you need to use is going to be dependent on where you live. Yeah, what, you, usually, the best is a 75, 60 to 75 watt okay. spotlight or f- floodlight and um, getting those soft white is the best yes. and you want to have them a 12 hour cycle of a uh, heat lamp and a proper UVB. I see we have an awesome Arcadia yep. 6%. Yep. You can, uh, when the chameleon is an adult, you can go all the way up to 12%. But remember, this is going to be T5HO like mm-hmm. the dude carries and these are high output meaning that the UVB is going to penetrate deeper. Some of these other brands only penetrate four inches Zoom in. and chameleons especially males they patrol their territory mm-hmm. and they're wanting to walk around and if they go below four inches they're not getting enough uvb to synthesize calcium or d3 to yep. u- utilize calcium and that's probably the number one issue in husbandry with chameleons is going to be uvb and yep. this is perfect yes i completely completely awesome. agree so i think it's time that we uh talk we showed the viewers an awesome panther chameleon talk about talk about what we're gonna feed and then you know go from there I'm gonna go grab a piece of wood (laughs) excuse me for one second so I'm gonna come out with an awesome bell this is my So I'm going to go ahead and, um, let me check and see. One second. Oh, yeah, to prop it up. Yep. Oh, man. And you see this guy? He's one of my breeders, and he's oh, very aggressive. He is awesome. Um, you can work with the babies. You can hand feed them. As you can see, just since I've had him out here and everything going on around him, he has changed his color hues greatly. He was uh, very bright, bright, and now he's darkening up. There we go. So, I am going to go ahead and put him in there. Wow. I dig it. He's going to love it. And it's going to bring out his reds, too. That's amazing. All right. I like that. Okay. Oh, wow. Hey, dude. And I have another male that I can show you. That's a Cap S. That's a bit rare of a locale. So there's different. They're not different species. They're from different areas or provinces in Madagascar yep. so that was my next question let's talk about locales chameleons yeah. are in the northern northeastern coastal areas of Madagascar they're also all over the world but I'm talking about panthers specifically uh yeah that boy oh <laughs> I love him isn't he, isn't he awesome come he, here dude <laughs> come here I'm gonna mess he with you he's known for being it. a jerk that's okay <laughs> I've been wow look at that <laughs> may, may Kane Kane has bitten awesome. me look more than that he, he's amazing. So um, this is the male. We also have a female we can show you. Um, can you get the get the other male? Oh, the, guys, look 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 at this. He's a, the, he also, this he is one. Just shed, so you can see he's still shedding right one now. One of the most beautiful animals on the planet. Right in my oh, hand here. Absolutely, absolutely. And so here's a and large male. <laughs> this is a cap est. Okay, he's really dark right now because he's been waiting for some sunlight, but. They've been known, and he's looking at everything around him, yeah. what's going on. But you can see this male, he's getting close to three years old. You can see how large he is. He has a lot more weight, a lot more mm-hmm. fat on him. This is a younger boy. He's just about a year old. So um, <laughs> they're extremely territorial. Their colors <laughs> are mainly emotional and not to blend in with their environment. Oh, man, he's wild. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's telling you. That. He's like, Come here, on. dude. I <laughs> know. I know. Here. That's sweet. Here. Awesome. Oh, so we'll wow. go ahead and put them out. So this is this is also an, another type. So you can see, it's uh, chameleons are often thought to make any color, which is true, but it depends by the locale. So this guy is going to have these different hues he can make with a red body, 
um, blue bars and maybe he'll fire up a yellow. But this boy right here, when he gets excited, he can get it completely mm -hmm. white with orange bars. So oh, this, this boy wow. I also uh, kept in my classroom. Um, I was aquatic science teacher and mm -hmm. um, he was real great with my students. I also have an, another boy as well. But this is a beautiful boy. I mean, he see, is, he's, oh, look he's, how blue he just got. Dude, he's got, yeah, he's mm -hmm. got some. So I'm gonna bring mm -hmm. another male out and this other male is they, they absolutely hate each other <laughs> look at that color put on a great color show this is one of my uh oh my, oh my goodness this is probably the prettiest animal i've ever seen in my life i've never seen a, a reptile have this besides fiji iguanas you have know, this type of blue I couldn't. even nosy bays i don't see them get this maybe i haven't seen the right nosy bays i couldn't agree with you more i used to breed <sighs> ball pythons very shortly and I met a local chameleon breeder that ended up trading me some crickets because I had just started breeding crickets. Oh. Um, and I used to breed them before Mister. I became a company. I, I bred them on my own. It's been about seven years. But um, watch when they see each other right here. It's a veiled chameleon. But he gave me a chameleon and I fell in love, sold my ball python collection, and now at times I have over 250 chameleons. So. That feeder yeah, bill. That's why bill. you breed feeders. That's you very know, smart. Yeah. <laughs> Five hundred dollars a month, and I'm mm -hmm. sure other breeders out there can definitely relate. Now look how white this boy's getting. Yep. You see that he's getting excited already, and what they're going to try to do is taunt each other. You definitely don't want to get them close because they're not just taunting. They will definitely throw down if they have to. But look at look at look how white and red he's getting. Oh I mean, God, like that American yeah. flag, red, white, and blue. <laughs> <laughs> they're definitely having a stimuli overload. You have all these beautiful oh. terrariums in here, so they're not able to fixate on each other. But this male is about six years old. He was also kept in my classroom. He's real gentle. These are known for having a really aggressive attitude and demeanor. However, <laughs> worked with from a young age, they're awesome. And they'll taunt. If you try to go into the cage, they'll act all big and bad. But that's what they're adapted to do bite you if you just you saw when the dude was grabbing yep. it it looked like he was going to bite him but yeah. they're they have taunting in their genetics yep. Yep. so you can still work with them you don't want to you don't want to overly stimulate these guys yep. so they're they're not necessarily a display animal but you don't want to take them out or take them to, to walmart or something or like to that, a like reptile like show and carry them on your shoulder right right it's definitely you don't ever want to do that with that. chameleons ever 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 i see people at the shows do that and a part of me dies inside so I'm gonna put this boy up and we'll start getting into a bit about their diet. Yes, yes, their diet and gut loading. And so here's a question for you, Tommy. Do the different carotenoids that you, so that you supply to them via various means of gut loading have any indication of the type of colors that they can flare up as? No, but definitely when you talk about the health of their eyes and vitamin, vitamin A, it's definitely a requirement. Here, let me get this guy and he's cool you know he's one of the biggest most intimidating males but he's, a, he's absolutely he's got awesome. the he's yeah, got I the mean, strength yeah, yeah he's he's definitely has uh the grip as well but um anyways you um with chameleon specifically you definitely want to focus on vitamin a and calcium and for a younger chameleon a little bit higher protein so these are some of the feeders that we offer um we offer super worms which are high in protein um, they are a feeder for chameleons, uh, probably one of the best staple feeders. Now, staple feeder is going to be a feeder that you can feed with every feeding and then you mix in. The variety is key. Okay. Yes. If you ate carrots all the time, you would turn orange, orange. you uh, know, you'd have so much vitamin A in you. Carrot so top. You would definitely. So you want to mix this up. Um, definitely with protein. Um, we have uh, some wax worms. Wax worms are going to be high in fat. These are going to be treats only. Okay. Oh, so yeah. they're little bitty. They're little bitty grubs. You can see them right there. I, I used to use these as uh, this one's dead. As oh, uh, they're, they're as in a the refrigerator. Uh, so they're oh, all okay. Like that makes sense. Makes yeah, yeah, sense. Yeah, yeah. See how cold they are. Yep. So yeah, Duh. they're mating. I'm not that yeah. slow. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, the, these are a good get-me-up food for sick rept. Honestly, for for underweight reptiles or reptiles that aren't. 
you know, doing as well as they should be. It's a good, easy thing for them to try to recuperate off of, but absolutely can't be a staple. Yeah, definitely. So these are Dubia roaches. They're really easy to breed. We even sell starter colonies. Um, you can keep a little bin, uh, keep it around 80 degrees, and you can uh, feed them dog food, or you can feed them some of uh, the dude's awesome bug chow. Mm -hmm. um, and especially if you're feeding them for gut loading, it's gonna be yes. really important to incorporate something like that. But um, you can see there's all various sizes, okay? And they almost look like a roly-poly to me, or an isopod. A little bit, um, yeah. They're not so, you know, like the flying roach that everybody's terrified of. Or the ones that can climb glass walls and your mm -hmm. walls. What are they called? Red runners. Oh, yeah. I had a colony of those for five minutes. <laughs> right and they were gone. Yeah, it climbed up my wall. And I was like, well, that's they, it. <laughs> they definitely can infest. We have bean beetles here. Now, bean beetles, they can only go to certain states, oh, wow. and we have permits to do so. Yeah, um, good. But they are definitely, you can see all the eggs, all those white spots right there, and you can see the little burrows they makes. These are great if you're getting a new chameleon. It's probably going to be younger, and they'll eat these as a treat. And you can also just leave it in here, put a little hole, and it'll slowly release the bean beetles. And um, kind of like a time release feeder. Um, let's see what else we got here. We got crickets. We breed our own crickets, okay? We have um, mix packs that offer them. These are a good source of protein. The best thing about crickets, however, is if you have a picky animal, it'll usually eat crickets. Dubia, um, sometimes you have to turn them on their back to initiate a feeder response, but it's something about the antennas on these crickets that just drive chameleons crazy. So definitely if you're a first time owner and you're just getting a chameleon, I would incorporate these into your diet, okay? Do you think it could be that fact that they, they are very similar to grasshoppers? Definitely. And that's definitely, what they like yes. to eat? And yeah. um, even in the UK, it's illegal here, unfortunately, but in the UK, they breed locust. And um, that's probably even better than this um, tropical house cricket is the type this is right here. And okay. it's probably the best. Um, some pet stores carry the brown cricket, um, which is good, but however, the protein content is lower. and. Uh, they're a great feeder insect, definitely not better than dubia, insect, uh, dubia roaches, so you want to try to get the one with the highest protein. Um, nice. We also have uh, fruit flies. It, again, if you have a young chameleon, you're going to need fruit flies, bean beetles. We have springtails. Nice. Okay? And these can be added. So after you get all the kits from BioDude, you put in the BioShot. This, you can actually have springtails that kill mold, eat fungi, they're detrivores, so any, any waste that's happening in your environment, they'll additionally help break it down. Um, isopods, we carry various species of isopods, and those actually can eat the fecal matter, which can reduce or eliminate, would you say eliminate? Eliminate. Eliminate you having to go in here and clean up feces, okay? Which is probably, especially if you're a big keeper, that can be a daunting task of yes. spending a Saturday scooping poop. Yep. Um, I've definitely been there and that's why um, I'm using these products because not only is it saving time, but it, it looks amazing. Mm -hmm. It's like my own little chunk of rainforest. Yep, it'll grow so, in and it'll grow in and be dense and, lo and look really, really nice. See, are, are these silks in here? Oh yeah, these are definitely silks. So oh. this is one of our summer feeders, okay? We offer them with live mulberry leaves. Nice. These are a little bit harder to find. Um, these are one fourth inch, so these are our small size silkworms. Again, great for baby chameleons. This is definitely a staple feeder, can be fed every day. Um, you don't want to overload it. Again, variety is key. With my guys, I usually have a feeder cup that I buy and I attach it to the side of the cage and it keeps all climbing insects contained. And I'll put some crickets, maybe two crickets, three dubia roaches, some superworms variety yes okay that's most important so with all of these different types of insects do you recommend dusting all of them with the proper supplements as well as gut loading all of them every single time and this cage if you're indoors okay and you're not giving them natural sunlight you want to give them d3 twice a month okay so this is phosphorus free now phosphorus is something that you want to watch in the diet too much phosphorus yes. can make the chameleon's metabolism start to break down the calcium in its own body. So you definitely want a pure calcium with D3 twice a month. Regular calcium, or you can get calcium carbonate, or you can get one of the specific brands, but you need calcium on every feeding. Every insect that goes in your cage needs to be covered in calcium because yes. they're just 
they're very poor with processing it. MBD. Yes. yes. If you're if you're a chameleon, if you're any type of reptile keeper that started from you know years ago when UVB wasn't as great, um, MBD or metabolic bone disease it's is like terrible. osteoporosis at, at a young age that just destroys the chameleon. So UVB is key. That can take you know this intermediate intermediate care animal to a very easy animal to care for just by getting some of these great yep. products, these great light. Excellent. Um, it's the most important care aspect if you want to take your reptile hobby to the next level and start carrying these a, a bit more difficult creatures, mm -hmm. panther chameleons, and it's and it's definitely doable with with uh, these products. And the last thing that I want to touch base with you, Tommy, is you know there is a. There's a school of thought that chameleons cannot be kept in glass enclosures. And I tell people that, you know, if you have fans and if you are keeping that air circulated at a high level, that you can. Do you agree with that or do you think that is, you know, the incorrect way and they should only be kept in screen cages? I would, I would think the reason that there's some conflict with that is because sometimes beginner keepers, if they don't keep that airflow going and they don't have the proper equipment, it would be very hard to pull off. However, there's keepers out there that keep them in PVC or essentially a closed like glass contain, yep. uh, enclosure and just with a screen door and, and it's fine because they have the proper setup. So definitely with knowledge, it's something that could be done. Okay. However, if you're a novice, I would go ahead and get Don't these uh, Reptobreeze cages, um, Zoomed cages. Mm -hmm. um, this is an extra large. Now, again, we were talking about babies. If you're getting a baby, you don't want to keep them in this. No. Okay. You want to keep them in a smaller cage, maybe a small. So there's small, medium, large, extra large. You would start them off in a small and then from small when you get them um, to a proper size, maybe let's say about six inches, you can introduce them in this cage. Again, um, you want to have a feeder cup so he knows where to go mm -hmm. to get um, his feeder bugs. So, Excellent. Awesome. Awesome. You know, I like how this cage turned out. I think he's he's back here, you know. Oh, yeah. He's like, yeah, why he's like, filming me? <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he, he's checking us out. But no, he's awesome. Tommy, I really appreciate you coming on to the BioDudes YouTube channel and Absolutely. really enlightening us on these beautiful animals. And Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Yeah, guys, make sure you check out his website, tcinsects.com. He ships nationwide. Bugs, you guarantee live arrival if they pick a particular type of shipping? Uh, yes, I do guarantee live arrival uh, nationwide. Um, we ship three days a week, Monday through Wednesday. We have our website, TC Insects. If you want to talk to me, you can just message the page at TC Insects. You can talk to me, my wife, uh, or one of our customer Absolutely. service employees. And uh, we'll be more than happy to take care of you and uh, provide you with some great bugs. Yeah, so. and, and, and we're really excited because I'm hoping to have Tommy come back onto the YouTube program to do a whole thing about veiled chameleons because he has a bunch of different, you know, different varieties of those too. And I just want to thank everybody for continuing to support my business endeavor of the Bio Dude. Come to my showroom here in Houston Monday through Friday, 8 to 4. Subscribe to me on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, you know, the whole works. Do the bides.